Hello, I'm Don Durham, and welcome to Patent Pod. I want to assure all of you who are listening, Patent Pod and the entire patent system remains dedicated to providing professional development to educators and support for families and students during these unprecedented times. Today, we're excited to welcome Marilyn Zecker to help us think about how to make the most out of our math instruction. Marilyn, thanks so much for joining Patent Pod today. I'm so glad to be here. I want to ask you, you um, work within a multi-sensory math program, and being that it's multi-sensory, it's um, Orton-Gillingham based. Can you kind of explain for us, what does that mean? Absolutely. When we say multi-sensory, we're absolutely talking about using all modalities, all sensory modalities that we can for teaching, and in an Orton-Gillingham based approach, it would be simultaneously. So where you might have a traditional math program that advocates the use of manipulatives, in an Orton-Gillingham program, we would advocate not only the use of them, but the connection to language and tactile kinesthetic at the same time. And this is also especially helpful for English language learners because you're teaching them the math vocabulary while they're handling the manipulatives that represent the quantities. So I think when we, we talk about an OG approach to anything, we're talking about explicit instruction, simultaneous processing, and we're talking about linking the language to the concept that you're teaching, whether it's literacy or math. And so in the approach that uh, I've been working on for over 20 years, because I was first a language therapist and an, a middle and high school English teacher, I was also a music teacher at one time, this is my fourth career, but I've been working on linking those math concepts with the visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile modes all at the same time, which enhances memory. And so that linkage creates memories in different parts of the brain and the evidence from neuroscience is that that aids retrieval. So when we think about, um, and I just kind of want to circle back and make sure I captured it all, we know that this involves explicit instruction and it's the simultaneous use of all modalities to really strengthen those memory traces. And as you as indicated, you know, this is especially important for our English learners, but I would also think, especially for our struggling students, whether it be Absolutely. in language or in mathematics. I just heard recently from a school where I've done some professional development. And I did a one day workshop for math coaches and I talked about place value and using one of our strategies for literacy is called gross motor, where you use big motor muscles uh, to help students model concepts. And we were talking about expanded form and standard form with place value. And this teacher reported to me that she had been working with her teachers in a, a, a very challenged school and she had students who had disabilities, she had students who were just way behind, and she started using the gross motor work, expanding her hands to say, expanded form tells us what a number is made of, then bringing the hands closer together and saying the standard form tells us its name. And she told me she immediately began seeing students say, oh, that's what that means. So modeling it with manipulatives like base 10 blocks, with young students, I prefer to use craft sticks because some students don't understand composing a 10 or decomposing a 10 until they build it. So I use craft sticks and ponytail holders. And that's the first, trans, first in, um, introduction to place value. And then we transition to the more traditional models like base 10 blocks, which are one level of abstraction greater. She told me she immediately saw increases in students' awareness, cognition, and their ability to apply what they had learned. So using modeling manipulatives, which are messy and time consuming, and the goal of using manipulatives is to get rid of them. Uh, we want students to see the quantity representations and how they are manipulated. And then talking, it builds that internal language which forms the basis of the internal monologue as the student is performing calculations. So you talked a, a quite a bit there about really it's taking a very abstract concept, whatever the concept may be, and your example is place value, but it's pretty abstract 
and bring it to something that's much more concrete, much more um, palatable for our students, whether they be struggling or, or your um, typically developing student in regards to making a concept something they can grasp in a much more concrete way. And as you had said, you know, the idea is to eventually take these manipulatives away. So we're offering that scaffold, that support, and then gradually releasing um, so they don't need that man those manipulatives and that scaffolded support. Now, you had mentioned L's, particularly useful for our English learners, but what other benefits might we see from using a multi-sensory approach, particularly in mathematics? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking about linkages, and this comes from our literacy instruction where we're linking phoneme to grapheme. We're linking the sound of A saying A ah, to its placement in a syllable. And so when we talk about that language and moving from the most concrete to the abstract, I talk about math being different from literacy. And this is a really fine point for math teachers. When we talk about teaching literacy and the structure of the English language, we are building structures from the most minute, from the phoneme to the grapheme, and then from linking those for syllables and syllables to polysyllabic words, to phrases, sentences, and connected text. Math is different. Math is a connection of concepts. So when we say in standards-based instruction that addition is putting together, subtraction is taking from, that applies at 5x minus 3x. And so when we talk about making those connections from one level to the next, it's not horizontal building of an accumulation of structures. It's a vertical instruction and concepts that can be applied up through algebra two. And so we can take those very basic concepts with simple manipulatives and scaffold that through instruction all the way to algebra. I think that leads me to my next question. And you make a good point. It's really about linking these concepts and how they go vertically. And, and I think, um, and maybe I'm wrong in assuming this, but I think when we say multi-sensory instruction, we think our elementary, our little guys. Absolutely. But what I'm hearing you saying is this can be applied to those much more advanced mathematic I concepts. Found that. Um, I've done some presentations, including for the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, on teaching algebra with manipulatives. You can model things like linear functions with unifix cubes and beads on a shoestring. And one of my favorite phrases, and I, I want to talk about that in a minute, is the language. But one of my favorite phrases comes from the Maryland State Department of Education and thinking in concrete language initially for our students to understand. And in our program, we talk about three levels of language, the language of the student, the language of the teacher, and the language of math. And we must get to the language of math. So in Algebra 1, when we start teaching linear functions, I like to use the phrase starting value and, co and constant rate of change. And so we give them an inverted instructional sequence where they build real life models of mathematical concepts with manipulatives. So we might say, uh, John found $10 in the parking lot. He added $2 each week into the piggy bank each week the same amount and the student builds that so he has a concrete tactile and visual model of what a linear function looks like you can build that with the unifix cubes which i call algebra blocks when we get to the middle school you can build it with simple strings on uh, beads on a pipe cleaner for pete's sake very inexpensive manipulatives but they learn the concept of slope intercept form before we ever map that onto graphing and procedures and anything else so that hierarchy of concepts in math builds incrementally from the most basic concept all the way up to algebra two. So I really think that's an important piece to think about is that this is not only intended for our younger students when we think about manipulatives, but as you had said, you build a concrete, a tactile and visual form of something much more complicated and complex, but allows for that abstract to be concrete before we jump to something a little bit more advanced or being able to take away those manipulatives. And I think that's a key piece that we want to be thinking about for our math teachers. Now, let me ask you this, and thinking about the current situation we're in, our students, especially across Pennsylvania and many across the country, are home, which means that they're either providing um, or getting instruction virtually from a teacher mm -hmm. or a parent or caregiver is providing that instruction. 
what advice or help can we offer those at home who may be able to incorporate some of these multi-sensory, multi-modality components to help their student at home? Well, that's a really great question too. Recently, working with teachers, we've been looking at ways they can use things that are commonly found around the house. So for example, your elementary teachers can teach place value and regrouping concepts with coins and money so that they're teaching coin values at the same time. I make a money place value mat with tens, ones, tens, and hundreds, the dollar being the hundred, hundred for really young children. And we talk about identification of the coins and the important point here for teachers, especially doing intervention or remediation, is that you must go back to the research of the core deficit in math. And that is numeracy or subitizing. So our original math concepts happen in the brain in the non-language hemisphere. And unfortunately, too often we teach to the language hemisphere. So we need to do pattern recognition for young children. So for example, you put those pennies in the ones place, don't line them up to make 10, put them in two dice patterns of five. So they recognize visually, tactilely, kinesthetically, they've built that pyramid of five with four and one in the middle or four with one on top. And when they see two sets of five, they know it's a 10 and it gets bundled. So parents can get coins easily or have them in their little coin piggy bank, take it out, teach place value with that. You can teach with lots of things around the house. You don't need commercial manipulatives. Teachers can also model on the screen if they're using a virtual environment. Uh, we know that, for example, in the neuroscience, the early math begins using the visual hemisphere, the tactile kinesthetic, and even pre-verbal infants can recognize differences in small quantities. Mm -hmm. The big takeaway, though, is that in third grade, when we begin learning multiplication, the activity shifts to the language hemisphere. Now, I want you to think about it. If I asked you to visualize the pattern of five, or according to some of the science, when we do sets of a set, we might recognize two dice patterns or a domino to create seven or nine. That then gets mapped onto, well, if two plus three is five, 20 plus 30 is 50. That's your level going up through the hierarchy of concepts. So what we know from the neuroscience is that once students begin learning multiplication, it depends more on language. So we need to be aware that we have to present multiplication in a multi-modality way. So they can build those patterns with unifix cubes or pony beads on a shoestring. And when you show them three sets of seven, for example, they can visualize it because the human brain can recognize that three. But if you ask anyone, can you see two plus three? Yes, but can you see six groups of seven? No. So we need to know that we need to uh, adapt and have some different teaching strategies for teaching multiplication facts that do not depend on timed drills. That's a really key piece of evidence for anything from third grade up and for middle school and upper elementary intervention. And there's a phrase I'd like to give you now that really has made a difference in many of the schools and with many of the teachers with whom I work. Teach fewer facts at a time to develop fluency over time. Mm. That's that idea of go slow to go fast. Exactly. And then I like, and here's one that you can do even virtually, ask your students, to fill out a blank times table chart or to write only the facts of say one times table or even four facts on a dry erase board. If you're working virtually, your students can put a white piece of paper in a plastic sheet protector mm -hmm. and write things down and it becomes a whiteboard. They can then hold it up and show it to you. Have them write down the facts that you're gonna use in the lesson that day and it becomes a near point reference. So they can look at it if they need it but you're giving them adequate practice to mastery of fewer facts at a time. And as you say, go slow to go fast, but they're, they're feeling confident because they're using facts that they generated. Mm -hmm. They're using fewer facts to solve problems in the lesson and the accommodations come out for independent work tests and quizzes. And I think one of the key pieces you had mentioned there is when we're thinking about this um, environment of learning from home and learning at home, whether an uh, educator is providing that instruction virtually 
or we're depending on a caregiver or a parent to assist with that, we can use everyday household items to assist in making this instruction a little bit more um, concrete, a little bit more understandable, being able to grasp those concepts. And maybe we need to slow down a bit um, and work on fewer concepts to really master those skills to assure accuracy. And I think that um, those folks who are now at home, our parents and caregivers would appreciate knowing we don't need to go on to a website and purchase manipulatives. We probably have a junk drawer in the kitchen that has some items that we could be using to assist anyone from our first grade students all the way up through our high school students with uh, much more complex math concepts. So I'm glad that we were able to have that conversation because I think in this time, a lot of us parents are wondering, how do I, I don't remember how I learned this concept of how to find the value of X. So I need a little bit of help in explaining it to my student and making it or my child. Um, and making it manipulative would certainly help that. So Marilyn, I'm so appreciative that you were able to take time out of your day to join Pat and Pod to have the conversation of how to use this multi-sensory, multi-modality instruction to really increase the student outcomes for our students in the math classroom, but to also assist us in the current situation we're in. So thank you so much for your time. We're so glad that you're with us. And I, I just wanna say to all of, the, all of you out there, particularly our teachers, you are inspiring your students and all of us beyond our wildest imaginations. Thank you so much for all you do. You're a welcome. Special thank you. A special thank you to John Ragsdale for producing this podcast. We'll see you next time on Patent Pod. Stay safe. Be well.